or something. But but yeah, so um, kind of talk about React and Context API with uh, using some of the new hooks they provided just through the React package and all. Um, first, I'll uh, kind of intro myself. So going on four years now, I'm a professional quarantiner and introvert. So I've been working as a remote developer for four years now. Um, first for a company out of Virginia called Remine, doing a big real estate application and just recently started a new position with a company called Shirley Co, uh, which is like a um, kind of a healthcare industry startup that's just really up and getting going. Um, so yeah, uh, primarily front end developer with React. Um, I've kind of touched a little bit on the back end stuff with like the Node.js later, but primarily focused on front end development with React and um, uh, shameless self promotion. If you ever want to just check out my portfolio or information about me, it's just beardedsquid.com. So uh, we'll kind of kick it off and, and get started here. So, <clears throat> so we're going to talk about context. So what is context? Um, it's that thing that helps you understand inside jokes. So it's my first dad joke, leading, leading off strong here. But, um, and, and all jokes are inside jokes about right now because you know, everybody's inside. So, but, um, but no, it's really a part of React that lets you create, provide, and consume a global state object or a global state kind of value. Um, so it's just basically just a way to get data from one place to another within a React application. Um, it helps kind of avoid prop drilling, which is where you have like a component and you pass a prop to another component and you pass a prop to another component and you pass it, you just keep on passing it down and it just kind of drills down and you know changes happen that way. So it's it's great for small applications and this is um, kind of an opinionated thing but this for my opinion, I think it's great for small applications um, just using context by itself um, because there are some like cons to context. Um, it can make components a little harder to reuse at times because um, it basically a component that relies on context kind of has like a dependency on the respective provider of what's giving you that context in the component hierarchy. So it's um, kind of loosely coupled with that and can have some some behavior that you know cannot be changed or whatever. So for bigger applications, oh, oh, oh no, I jerked to jump forward too fast. Um, so for bigger applications uh, where context is being consumed in a lot of places, it can cause a lot, cause a lot of necessary re-renders, um, which you know we generally want to avoid in a React application just for performance basis. Um, probably the biggest con of context, um, it has absolutely no, um, you know, relationship to Nicolas Cage's greatest action film ever, uh, Con Air. So. I uh, really missed a great marketing opportunity there, in my humble opinion. Way to go, Zuckerberg. So, but uh, so another thing you hear a lot when talking about context is Redux versus Context API. So you'll have like, um, and it because it, Redux has been around longer, um, and there are some kind of caveats to that. You know, like with Redux being a little bit more, you know kind of stable in, in essence, but we'll kind of talk about that. So with Redux, um, it has some benefits compared to like context API. Redux can use middleware to help resolve like some side effects, like doing actions asynchronously or like waiting for a promise to resolve to kind of update your global state. Um, and then, um, you know, you can use these middlewares, basically, you know, any, big web application has to, you know, execute some complex logic at times, um, usually including these asynchronous work, such as like making Ajax requests. And then, um, you know, the code is no longer a function of its inputs at that point. So Redux in, in essence, and even context is synchronous, you know, it pops off, you know, in order. So to add some kind of asynchronous stuff in there, you have to use kind of a middleware. Um, but we won't get in like super into Redux. I'm just kind of explaining some of the pros and cons versus using one over the other. Uh, Redux also has some nice dev tool support where you can view like a complete history of your state changes, which makes uh, debugging a bit nicer and um, all as well. 
So uh, kind of jump in here. Um, uh, oh yeah, Redux is probably the better choice for large scale applications that require a lot of global state changes and or API re requests within the reducer. Um, but there's tons and tons of articles out there. Uh, it's just kind of controversial. People are back and forth either way. And so feel free to kind of Google, you know, Redux versus context, and you can kind of see a lot more um, probably better opinionated stuff than, than just from me. Um, so we'll kind of start off the basic context use. like So like when context kind of first came out and we had this new idea of being able to have like a global state and pass information down from one area to another, this is kind of the basic way it started. Uh, so to like create a context, we'll use like the create context method here um, on this top example. And, you know, it's just straight as a part of React. So it's basically a method from React um, that you can import in. And it just accepts a parameter for its default value. And then the create context method actually returns an object with a provider and a consumer component, um, which here we have in the second example. So you have the provider and consumer that's returned from the new context that was created in the method above. And the provider component is what makes the state available to all the child components. So no matter how deeply nested they are within the component hierarchy, uh, the provider component receives a value prop. And this is where we pass our current value, as you can see here, in where the provider component is kind of declared and we're passing in the color blue um, to all the children. So, and then the consumer, <clears throat> as the name implies, uh, consumes the data from the provider without any need for prop drilling. Um, so, you know, all, all of that being said, this is a little clunky and we can make it better with hooks. Um, so hooks were introduced in some of the recent um, versions of React and they are a way to be more functional um, in React and kind of break away from class components a bit um, and just use more functional kind of JavaScript. So hooks are a type of function that enable the execution of custom code in a base code in React, hooks are special functions that allow us to hook into core features. Uh, React hooks provide an alternative to writing class-based components by allowing us to easily handle state management from functional components. So we're able to use things like the new use effect to access you know, different component life cycles um, within those hooks. So next, uh, we'll talk about using the use context hook. Um, so this makes things a little bit uh, more s uh, simple and kind of narrowed down. So before we had to um, <clears throat> had to use consumer basically to wrap the component we wanted to consume the context in with a function as a child that passed in the value. So it was kind of a little little clunky because you had to wrap you know a component with consumer and you're basically just doing a function that passes the prop in. Um, so now we are able to basically, a uh, mouse scroll wheel apparently will jump you forward. That's the new thing I learned just now in Google Slides. So, um, so where was I? Oh yeah, so now, now with the use context hook, uh, this is a lot more straightforward. We just use, con just use the use context method and access our state with it and boom, there it is. So no longer having to wrap in consumer, you just basically, if you're using it in a separate component, you import in your context, you declare your value with a constant, and then use the hook, use context to basically subscribe to that. And then you can console log out the value and it passes it down. So you're able to access that from, you know, a child component from a parent component that may be five or six levels up, you know, or not. So that's the use context hook. Uh, kind of the next part of this is the use reducer hook. So it works a lot like a uh, reduce function, um, so, you know, like where you have you know, the kind of the accumulator and then the, the current value and it reduces that to how you return it out. So basically um, it, it's an alternative to use state. It accepts a reducer of type 
uh, with a state, a function that's basically passes in state and action, and then returns your new state. Um, basically returns the current state paired with the dispatch method. You know, if you're familiar with Redux, you probably already know how this works a little bit. Uh, it's really similar to that kind of boilerplate and framework. Um, it is preferable to use state when you have complex state logic that involves multiple sub values or when the next state depends on the previous one, um, which we'll, we'll see here shortly. Um, so this is like an example of a reducer. Um, you're declaring use reducer and you know you have your reducer function that you're passing in which is basically just a switch that takes an action checks the type of it and says if it matches this case do this and return the new state um, this is a real simple kind of um, iteration of it um, so i kind of leave it here for a second um, but yeah you can see basically you're getting the state and dispatch from the use reducer all right, so move on. So let's um, let's actually look at some code and look at some examples. I'm gonna paste these repos into the chat just so they're there. Um, there's a starting point repo. That's kind of like where I'm gonna start at. And there's a final point that hopefully I'll get to without too much trouble. And, um, and then it's got a lot of documentation. Actually all my um, slide notes and presenter notes are available in the repo as well. So you can experience my corny jokes more than once if you know, you're willing. So, yeah, so should be a good time either way. So let's go ahead and jump into the code. Let me pull up this and here is this. So what we have here, boys and girls, is a to don't app. Because everybody and their mother does to do apps all the time. So this one's a to don't app. If you're the type of personality where you do everything you're supposed to, but you just randomly charge in and do things you shouldn't, this is a good app to basically keep up with things you should not do. So huh, just doing something a little different. So, um, you know, like I said, we made an app of things to not do instead. It's a relatively small application with some kind of unnecessary complexity I threw in just to show, show up, uh, showcase a few benefits of use context and use reducer. Um, it's just bootstrapped with create react app just because it's super easy just to get started. Um, I threw in I threw in some SAS modules uh, just using node SAS, um, which we're not even gonna look at styling stuff, you know, for the most part. Um, and then I use like material UI just for some base components because I didn't want to, you know, have to go crazy. So my coworkers are sending me twist message notifications, which you probably see in there. So, <laughs> so I forgot to turn that off. So that's fine. I appreciate the, the help. Um, so what it does currently, currently it just uses local state in this app.js file. Um, we just have where we have declared an array. We have an empty array that we start out with. And the goal is basically we want to update this state with an input and a button that triggers this function to basically, you know, update that state. So we're just passing down the state here, um, you know, in our, you know, add to don't or our to do's here. We're just past our to don'ts. I'm already messing this up. But uh, to don'ts, you know, we're just getting passed down. And just from the state, you know, into our other things like our input container. And, you know, this is basically where we're creating them. And then we have like a to do's container or to don'ts container that's just mapping over our array and returning our items. So we'll kind of look at so this is basically the functionality of the app currently, you know, things to not do. We should not do the funky chicken. So we're going to add that, you know, that's one thing we don't want to do. Oh man, I did it, you know, oh, but it doesn't remove it. So that's something we're gonna have to add to the app. You know, we have where we can create these and it adds them, um, you know, but there's, you know, it's the Macarena. So, but we don't have a way to remove these currently. So that's something we'll have to add, you know, here shortly. Um, so here's the things we want to do. We want to create a context for our to don'ts. Um, we want to use our use context hook 
to create that at our app provider so we could basically consume our context lower down, like down here in the Tadonk container. Um, and then we want to use the use reducer hooks uh, to define a reducer that handles some actions passed in. So basically our CRUD operations, you know, we want to create our Tadonks and we want to be able to remove our Tadonks and it update all in one global state. Um, so we're going to go, that's our, you know, kind of thing. And then if uh, I think we'll have time, uh, but yeah, the last thing I want to try to sneak in is one thing you can do with uh, user reducers has a really cool and not optional initializer function as a third parameter that you can pass in and it basically replaces what your initial state can be like if you want to persist something in local storage and i'll kind of get to that and explain it. so first thing we want to do is we want to take a look and actually create our context so i have like a context folder here um, I try to keep things kind of modular just in my stuff. Um, so I have like components, which we import in. It's each of its own, you know, kind of modular type thing. And we just import those into where we need to in our main application or even lower down in the application where, where we want. So first thing we're gonna do is actually create our context um, and still kind of keeping with the, the modular theme here we're going to, um, you know, basically do it in our uh, our own modular file. And so what we're going to need is we need React. We're going to need our create context um, part of React that they give us. And we're going to use our use reducer as well. Um, and they're just importing those in from React. And uh, the next part we'll get to in a second. So the first thing we really need to do with our context is we need to initialize yeah, our, our state. Sorry to bother you, but can you zoom? It's really hard. Oh, to yeah, see yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was actually, I should ask that. Yes, yeah, so let's see. Uh, wrong one. Let's see. Control. How's that? We good there? Yeah. Much awesome. better. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for for saying that. I, that should have. Uh, so we want to initialize our state. Um, and it keeps auto completing that for me and we don't want that so but so constant we're going to declare a constant here equal initial state equals and we're just an empty array same thing that our you know basically we were doing in our local state we're just uh, initializing um you know our basic initial state um so let's see go one down size just because I couldn't read it on this other screen. Um, I got different resolutions per screen. Let's see. Let me know if that doesn't work. But if uh, so, the next thing we want to do is basically uh, create our app context. So we do that by declaring an app context and we use our create context function, which takes um, a default value, which is our initial state. And then possibly like a dispatch or you know the next thing which is like where we send our actions to do updates um and then the next thing we do let's see is we create an app provider so we app provider this is what it'll basically provide our state down to our other components we pass in our children because we're basically app provider wraps your app and it passes everything that it's there in, you know, down from the children down to it or from itself to the children, I should say. So there we go. We're using a functional component here, just using the fat arrow syntax. So the first thing we do is we declare uh, our state and our dispatch. And we're going to use reducer here, um, which <clears throat> is basically, you know, this is your, um, where you pass in your previous state, you pass in an action, and then you basically return new state, um, is kind of how that works. Um, so we're actually going to kind of modularize this out a little bit. So we'll just leave this open for the second, and then uh, return... This is where we're taking the context 
Oh, I can't spell today. And then the provider. And then here's where we pass in the value. That value is just the state and the dispatch that we are getting from userducer. And we are providing that to the children. So now what we need to do um, is actually we need to do one thing, which is export out our app context because we're going to be pulling that in to our other pieces of the application and our provider because we're going to need that in the higher level of the application to wrap our basic you know, thing and basically get that in, in there so we can provide our state now. So the next part, we're going to go ahead and save this and it'll format it because um, it's nice like that. But the next thing we're actually going to do is declare our reducer so that we can pull that in to our context and use it. Um, so what we're going to do here is just basically declare our con to don't reducer. And all we're passing into this is just our basically our current state and then our action. Um, so And we're going to export it out so we can use it in a little bit and just as a module. So what we have, uh, basically, we just make a switch case statement here. Uh, we're going to base this off the action type because the action type is just a string that's being passed in. And uh, what I do? All right. So then it's giving me some funky stuff because I haven't finished the thing. Um, so our first one is we want to add a to don't. Right, that's kind of the first thing we want to be able to do. So we're going to look at that, and then we're going to basically return. Um, we're going to declare what our new state is. So we're going to say new state from add, and that equals. We're going to use a spread operator here because we don't want to mute, like basically mutate our state. We're going to create a copy of our current state by spreading in the state there, and then we're going to pass in our action dot payload which at this point it'll probably just be our you know our object with the name of the to don't in it um, <clears throat> so let's see move this over here all right so then basically we've got that and then all we want to do is return out our new state from add I'll let that auto complete for us and still yelling at me here for a second. I think, it, oh, yeah, because we have to have basically we have to have the default in there as well. So, default, we just want to return what state is. Um, it's a pretty general case from that. Uh, all right, and then I said, chilling at me a good here bit. Case. Next one is going to be our remove to don't. And people just kind of basically capitalize these things um, just because they're basically just strings you're passing in for this case statement and nothing, nothing much else. So here <clears throat> we're actually going to do new state from remove. And this will be our state. And then we're going to basically filter out um, our to don'ts. We're going to filter out the one that uh, that matches what we're being passed in. So let's see. Filter and then first thing we do is we have an item. That's our function. Pass in. And we basically just want to return item dot name that doesn't equal the um, action dot payload which is just the, the string. Our pass in name, the one we want to remove. And then we just return an array with the new state from remove. All right, so there we go. This is yelling at me, so I'm just going to copy and paste this from my final piece. You can kind of see it's a little bit cleaner with our notes in here. But yeah, so ignore these parts. We haven't got to that yet comment that out for now. So there we are with our reducer. So we want to go back to our context here. 
<clears throat> and actually use this reducer in our context. Um, so what we're going to do is within the use reducer, the first thing we pass in is the to don't reducer. And it auto imports it in there because VS Code's nice like that. And then um, the next thing we pass in is our initial state. So basically when the app initializes, it's going to basically just make sure that our state is just an empty array for our initial state. And then the reducer is going to basically update that when we send out dispatches or whatever. So that's pretty pretty well and good. Let's see what the next step I have here on line here. Um, da -da -da -da, ba -ba -ba. All right, so we've basically done that. We've created our reducer, we created context, and now we need to use our context. So what we're gonna go to is like just the highest level of our application at the moment. And we are going to just wrap our app with our provider. So we wanna do that. Let's see. So first thing we do is we import in our provider, I'll pull that in, because we exported that out from our context file. And then context, so there it is, pulling that in. And then all we're doing is wrapping our app with the provider. move the app inside there because we remember we're passing the children or we're basically taking the children we're passing the information down to the children there <coughs> excuse me some water so there we go we're passing it in we now have our app provider casing our app component and we're able to basically access our context and access that in a kind of a global state. So we don't need this anymore. So we're gonna go ahead, because we're not gonna use this local state, we're gonna use our, um, that, and we're not gonna use like this particular function right here where we passed it down. We'll just do it down there in the actual input container. So we're gonna remove this stuff. And then what we wanna do is we wanna pull in our um, our state from our context. So the way we do that is we're just saying const and we're gonna go ahead and destructure this into the state and we just use context here. Um, we'll go ahead and get it to auto import. You can see it basically auto imported here. We're not using use state anymore, so we'll get rid of that. But use context here and then we just pass in app context. And bam, we have access to our state. And <coughs> our state is once again, just our array of to don't items. So we can replace to don't since that doesn't exist anymore. And we'll just put our state there. And we're not even gonna use this here anymore. We're, we're gonna put this down here in the thing. So there we go. We're already looking a little bit better here. Um, we've got this kind of kind of aspect it out. So the next thing we want to do um, is, let's see, I think we go down to our input container because um, we don't go down change. Here's our button. So with the in component container, I'm going to speed this along because it's taking a little bit longer. So I'm just going to hey, copy and then replace. So what I did is you can see I pulled in the app context here. And then we, um, this is just a local state we're using for the form input. And we're declaring our dispatch that we'll use to basically pass an action and create it to don't. So this is actually where it's gonna pass that dispatch in. All we're doing is sending it this, ta this type because an action is literally just an object that we're sending with a type and a payload. <clears throat> so we have the type here is add to don't. Our payload is just an object with the name and that's it. So whatever is in our current state of the input, and that's what we pass on. And then we're changing our button here to basically do this. So if I didn't break anything terribly, should have, you know, um, check honeydews, because you don't want to do that. So this, so yeah, we're basically still working here. You know, this create react app or webpack stuff reloaded that. So now it's still not removing our stuff. So that's the next thing we want to do. We want to be able to use this uh, other reducer piece where we're removing to don'ts 
And so we're going to get that in there. That is in the to don't um, object here. So we have this we have this function already that we can use here, but it doesn't do anything. And this is handling the shame of doing something we weren't supposed to do. This is what this function does, because we want to remove it if we actually did it, because there's no going back at that point. So we're going to our to don't. And let's see, going to basically do the same thing we did earlier. We're going to basically declare and use our dispatch, but we're going to send a different one this time. So we're going to use our dispatch here, and we're just same thing here. I'll do it a little bit more manually this time just to show, but we're pulling use context in as just a piece, you know, of React, and we're using that here. We need to pull in our app context. So we're going to do that from importing that in. up and there it is context folder scope down to it we know it's in the context one that's where we're using that app cool so we got our dispatch here so what do we want to do with it we want to actually dispatch out that action which is just our function and all we're passing in once again is just our kind of uh our action which our action is just the type which is remove to don't and our payload and in this case, all we're passing the payload in is the name. And that name is already coming from where we basically mapped each one of our things in the array and all we're passing down as a prop. Here is the name of the to don't. This is just a simple object and all it's got is the name. So we're using this here. So cool. So now we should be able to remove our to don'ts. So once again, say, you know, don't do the funky chicken. Oh. I did it. Nope, it's not working. So what do we do here? What am I missing? On click handle. Oh, I think I was actually declared that as a function. So I don't want to dance. I'm sitting down. That'd be weird. There we go. We can remove our things now and say, you know, we got that. So we basically hooked up our thing. So let's say our next kind of piece of this is like, you know, um, the, these are some things we don't want to do. We don't want to do the Charleston. Um, we don't want to run with scissors, right? So those are things we don't want to do. But what happens if I refresh it? Ah, oh, they go away, right? Because we're just storing this, you know, our state is just within this. It's not really stored anywhere. We're not hitting a database. We're not really storing anything to make this persistent. Um, but what's interesting, and this is something I thought was really cool part of um, this, is that we can basically just use local storage here, which is just, you know, memory in your browser. And just basically what we're going to do is every time we fire off our dispatch and we pass through an action, we're actually going to just store this item um, as well into local storage. Now, local storage is interesting because it only can can store strings. You can only store strings in there. So what we have to do basically is pass an object as a string and then we pull it back out and, you know, and then stringify it just using JSON. So we're going to turn the object into a JSON string and then um, store it. And then when we pull it back out, we just, you know, parse it and then do our thing there. So that's storing it. We're storing these items now. But we have to do something to basically initialize this. Um, and that's over here where we use this use reducer function. What's neat about this use reducer hook is it actually takes a third argument, which is like an initializer function. And you can do just something here. And then basically, whatever you do in the function, whatever you return will actually replace this initial state as the initial state. So what's really cool is let's see pull my stuff out over here so what we want to do is create a function that basically grabs what we stored in local storage pulls it out and makes that the initial state and i'll actually show you all this here in a second in um like chrome dev tools so we're going to remove this guy here just this basic you know anonymous function we're going to actually persist eight. We're going to push this guy in here. 
and it's yelling at me for some reason. Did I spell something wrong? Oh, yep, I did. My Alabama graduate education there, coming into effect. So we spelled something wrong. It yelled at us. We know now. So what we're doing now is we're saying, hey, when this starts up, run this function. We're going to see if there is actually a local storage item of to don't items in local storage. If and we're using a ternary here, because we're basically saying return if this exists, because if it doesn't, local storage is just going to return a null, so it'll be like a falsy. Say so if this exists, though, go ahead and grab that data from local storage and use that. So that way we can kind of persist these items. So if you look at it now, we can say, you know, go back to do the Charleston. There's something we don't want to do. Oh, we refreshed it. It stays there, persisting. So how's it doing that? Like we can take a quick look. If you look at Chrome DevTools here, and actually look at this application tab, it has a neat piece of it where it shows you what's in local storage. And it's just basically a key value pair. And you can see where it basically JSON stringified that whole object. And then we're just pulling it back out, parsing it and storing. So now we have a cool little application that persists our items. And, you know, so say tomorrow I come over here and I reload this thing, you know, go all the way out, reload it. And I was like, oh man, you know what? I actually did the Charleston yesterday and I forgot to say that I did it. So now I can remove it. And so there we go. Um, that's pretty much the whole kind of basic concept of, you know, using context and using it with uh, use reducer and your use context hooks uh, where it kind of makes things a little more streamlined. Um, it makes it a little bit more familiar to those who have used Redux and are used to passing dispatches that are basically actions with types and stuff. So that's pretty much my presentation at this point. Um, once again, I did throw those uh, GitHub repos out into the, um, into the, uh, the chat there. So you can look at the starting point, look at the final point and compare. Um, I've got my notes in there just in a readme um, that are linked there as part of that. So. Thank you all for checking it out and listening to my dad jokes and my ridiculous to don't app presentation. And um, yeah, so if y'all have any questions, y'all feel free to go ahead and shout those out now. I'll do my best to, to answer some of that for you. Thanks, Dave. Greatly appreciate that. Yeah, I probably went through it a little fast, but um, yeah, I, I guess I'll just throw out the first question just for fun. Uh, not really a context <laughs> question, but just wondering about the inspiration behind this. Have uh, you personally had bad experiences with uh, uh, bad dances, or is it more from observing other people and really wanting to protect them from that? Yeah, it's more of like a protective measure, um, you know, being through my Caucasian heritage, I'm not the greatest dancer in the world and uh, my, my sense of rhythm is a little off. So it's more definitely a protective measure. Um, I want to keep up with things I should not do. The majority of those being different dances. So. Leanne, I have a similar question to myself. <laughs> and uh, it, well, a similar question to another person. <laughs> question <laughs> but um when do you reach for a reducer versus um you know just you stayed i know you talked a little bit about that and then also yeah. you know there was somebody that asked about redux versus context and yeah so um kind of when you want to use a reducer is like so a, a good example of this like say like back in our uh, initial app things say we declared um you know, a, you know, local state, um, this is an array. Let's say we have local state and then we have, um, you know, our set local state and then basically equals use state and say that this isn't just an empty object. Like you would kind of generally, um, oh, I didn't import it in. I just wanted to switch it all back. 
So say that our actual initial state is like days of the week. So we have like Monday, um, and which is an empty string and Tuesday. And we have like all these different actual, you know, items that are in the object. And we actually want to update just a day, a particular day. So instead, so when you have like these complex objects or something of that nature that you want to update, it's better to use a reducer in that aspect. So you can just update pieces of it or remove just pieces of it instead of, um, because if it's just a string, you can just set it. It doesn't really matter what the previous state was. But in this aspect, you know, if you're changing something, you need to know what that previous state was to make that piece of a change instead of changing the whole thing. Because, you know, if you go in and you do set local state and you just, you know, say, oh, I want to change this to, you know, Tuesday, yes. You know, so basically what that does is it erases Monday and all the other days of the week that are in there and your whole thing is just an object with Tuesday and yes in there now. But what you could do and, you know, using a reducer because you're passing in that previous state, you're saying, oh, I want to update just Tuesday and it basically fires that off and basically does that instead. So yeah, when you basically need to access and kind of work with your previous state, that's the best time to use reducer in that aspect. Thanks, that was really helpful. And great talk, uh, I enjoyed it so much. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> cool, and I think you, oh yeah, here we go. Can you help people understand when you'd reach for Redux versus context and why I think context is best for small applications? So yeah, um, when I generally reach to Redux is when I need to do a lot of complicated, um, kind of global state management. So say you have an application where you're pulling in a user object on a login and you want to store that user object because you are you need to know if they're signed in, you need to know what their name is, and you need all those different items in different places of the application. You know, say you have a link up here on the right side that's just their, an avatar and you're grabbing that from the user object and their name, but down here, you know, you have a logout button and another thing, and that actually needs to log out the user and handle all that action there. So you're kind of maintaining a lot more complex state and global state in that aspect. And Redux allows you some things um, that that Context API doesn't, where you can basically add middleware to where your store and like where you're kind of creating your store and it allows you to kind of do some more asynchronous type actions to kind of not have um, those weird side effects with like calling a, you know, a request, waiting on your promise, because you're going to get a promise immediately returned, but you're still going to have to wait on the response. So you don't want to fire off the next action, that type of thing. So generally I would say a lot more complex applications, um, can probably better benefit from using Redux. But what's interesting is too, that even the latest version of Redux actually uses context API as well. You actually pass your store in from Redux with a provider. Same thing we're doing here. Um, and it helps you know, maintain that just really straight source of a global state. You have that really you know, contextual object. It's just a one object and each piece of it is another piece of the state. Um, another thing too is, which I know I've actually, so this is a weird spot, but I know I've used, like you can have different providers, but I think you have to use for context, but if I remember right, you have to use like some, uh, some like different NPM modules or kind of other packages, second party uh, libraries or third party libraries to basically maintain a lot of like uh, different providers at one point, so you can have different contexts. Um, it's been a little while since I've done that, but um, so yeah, that's another kind of caveat too. If you want to expand it and make it a little bit more like Redux and have multiple pieces of the global state, I think you have to use like some third party libraries with context. So if you want to just basically keep with one thing for whole, you know, maintaining that, you can do it that way. So I hope that answered, answered your question there. Mustafa, who is my new boss. So. It did answer it. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so.
So cool. Anybody else have any other questions or anything else I can quickly Google and give you a better answer to? All right, well, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And then if we have anything else, happy to, to answer questions or switch back if we need to. So, but yeah, thank you all for hanging out with me and going through this. Hope it was entertaining as well as educational, which is <laughs> always my goal. Yeah. This is great. Um, thank you so much, Lee Allen. Um, enjoyed that. And thank you for creating this repos and links to your slides. So I will post that in Magic City Slack as well as in the meetup comments. So feel free to grab that and share that. I'll also be sending everybody the recording of this um, so that you can watch it or share it with, with others. Um, Trend Micro gives away for $25 Uber Eats gift cards um, each month. And um, so Justin randomly selects those people. And so our winners this month are Rachel, Bradley, Ben, and Dave. So um, send Justin your email address or you can just post it in the chat or send it to him privately in the chat so that he can send you those gift cards. And um, congrats to those people. Uh, also, just um, you know, please let me know if you have something you want to talk about. Um, give a talk or a discussion topic for next time or any of the months to follow. We'll keep remote until further notice. I hope that you all are staying safe and well, and um, let's keep this community going. So uh, thanks for joining us. Happy Friday. Uh, Justin posted a, an event there. So check that out. That looks really fun. Um, but otherwise, y'all have a great one. Feel free to hang out and chat a little bit if, if there's more you want to talk about. Otherwise, have a good one. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. That was so good. Yeah. I got everybody's email addresses. Oh, good. And please come to Capture the Ham. Learn how to use AWS. That looks fun. Daxco people should come because they get to use AWS all the time. I will consider that. It sounds really competitive, though. It, it can be. There's a can lot you of say a little more about what that is, Capture the Ham? Um, so um, we're doing a, a threat defense challenge. We've partnered with um, Tech Birmingham and uh, Central Alabama ISSA, as well as some other groups to kind of help us out. And um, normally threat defense challenges are like very security focused, security team. And so they're kind of that red team, blue team stuff. But since everything's shifting to cloud, hybrid cloud, we came out with our 2021 to bridge the gap between development and security. So for this threat defense challenge, you actually are better off being a developer than a security person because you're gonna be in GitHub, you're gonna be using Jenkins, you're gonna be using AWS, S3, EC2, Lambda, and people are gonna hack that stuff and you've gotta figure out how to defend it. So we're seeing that the traditional security folks are struggling and folks that are used to using all those automation and web friendly tools are really like kicking ass in these threat defense challenges. So we've got some good, uh, some DAXCO folks who are interested, Atlas RFID, BBVA Compass, they do more AWS in Birmingham than anybody. They've got over a hundred and something accounts. Like they've got two teams of like uh, five people a piece. Like I think they're just going to clean up with everybody because they do AWS plus security. But there's also some security folks, and I think just some bright people that are that are going to join too and can be able to pick it up. But I think it's going to be a lot of fun just because it's not like that heavy lane kind of security thing. It's more of a kind of a, a developer modern type challenge. I had to push because they were kind of pushing back because these things have been so hard. And I was like, I know developers in Birmingham, they're going to come, we're going to have fun, we're going to do the new one. And so that's what we're doing. What do you say to people who are new to, to security or web developers that are like, I don't know what any of this is, can, can they come and learn? And Yes, if you're a React developer, you're probably better than someone that's new to security for this challenge because you know how to use GitHub already. You know about the commits and the changes and things like that because we're, you, we're going to attack the CICD pipeline and the pipeline is, okay, we made the change in GitHub. It's approved. Now it goes to Jenkins to automate it. It passed the test. Does it go to production? We're going to attack Jenkins. We're going to attack these different things and you're going to have to figure out where there's malicious code in your build. But we're going to give you tools like SNCC where you can find it in GitHub. You can go ahead and look at 
your dependencies. Then we're going to give you deep security and cloud conformity. Conformity checks your configurations of AWS. You have to constantly check your configurations because they're changing services you're using. Your developers are changing services. So it's constantly a moving target. Then we're going to give you some runtime kind of blue team tools that you can use. But, you're, but for that tool, we're going to make you leverage the APIs for that tool. So if you're used to the console, that's not going to be that great. You're going to need to be a developer and learn how to use those rich APIs to make it do its, its magic and everything as opposed to getting in there. So it's really a developer heavy, heavy challenge. So I try to market it anywhere I'm around developers. I try to get them to come because I know they'll eat it up. And we really want, as far as a security expertise company as a cybersecurity company, we want developers to be secure. We want them to make secure applications that don't are that aren't vulnerable to malicious threats. And we can also do it without slowing down the CI CD pipeline because we can give you the code and, and you don't you never have to get into the console. So and we're doing a lot of stuff with RASP. If you know anything about, you know, everything's turning into us. Sorry, I can nerd out all day. Yeah. Infrastructure turning security yeah. to code. So we have security code infrastructure to match now the infrastructure's code because we're getting all the stuff like Lambda and different things, serverless services, so we don't have to deal with operations people because they're the worst. Cool. Thanks, Justin. Appreciate that. And yeah. shout out. Oh, I was going to say, thank you for giving that some context. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mr. Pines brown here. That's good. <laughs> Right. And, and thanks to Trend Micro for supporting Birmingham developers. <laughs> we love it. We love developers. Cool. Check it out. I brought it back the 8 bit Homewood Patriots shirt. Oh, nice. Homewood Patriots. So. I Patriots anymore because Jarrett Stedham could be the quarterback and they could pick up Scam Newton. So, how is the Alabama DNA going to deal with that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I saw what you did there. Switch to Homewood. <laughs> Homewood now, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, as soon as you stop the recording, it'll start compiling, and I'll send you the link, and you can shoot it out to everybody.